Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Margaret Lowe. I'm CEO of WBUR, Boston's NPR news station, and it is lovely to have so many of you joining us for Leveling the Playing Field, a virtual city space conversation about the inequities in STEM education, the implications of that, and about potential fixes. Like so many of you, we long for the day when we can once again gather in person, and I don't think that's too off too far off, but there's also something quite wonderful about the ease of being able to bring so many of you together, albeit virtually, um, from across the country to grapple with some of the biggest and most complex issues of our time. Our topic this afternoon, or I guess this evening, certainly fits that bill. Uh, every day, there are more and more people working in science and technology, engineering and math, advancing science and innovation. More than 17 million people in this country have STEM jobs, everything from software engineers to data scientists, statisticians, physicists, the list goes on. And we know that the number of jobs in these fields is going to continue to rise. But like so many dimensions of life in this country, there are stunning disparities. Blacks represent just 7% of STEM workers, Latinx 6%. Why is that so? Uh, that's the subject we're here to explore tonight, and we have an exceptional lineup for that conversation. Before we roll, I wanna thank Olin College of Engineering for making this forum possible. I had the great pleasure of meeting, meeting Olin's president, Gilda Barabino, last summer, shortly after she stepped into the job, right smack in the middle of the pandemic, but that did not slow her down. President Barabino is passionate on the subject of STEM education and has her own story to tell, so I'm delighted to pass the floor to her to share a few thoughts. Hello, I'm Gilda Barabino, president of Olin College of Engineering in Needham, Massachusetts. Olin was founded two decades ago to revolutionize education and prepare students to make a positive impact on the world through engineering. Thank you all for joining us for Leveling the Playing Field. I would like to thank WBUR for this forum and for helping us all examine the connections between equity and STEM education. WBUR is a valued and trusted source of news and information. And with forums like this, they are truly public radio providing a public service. I would also like to thank our panelists for sharing with us their insights and experience on equity and the value of STEM education. Throughout my education, I experienced inequities and barriers that marginalize people of color especially in STEM areas. And like many from historically underrepresented groups, especially young black women, I had to overcome obstacles created by racism and sexism to forge my own path through education and academia. Unfortunately, these obstacles remain and still cause young people of color to be pushed to the margins of education, especially STEM education to overcome centuries of educational inequities and provide the power of learning to these young people, we must rethink our approach to how we teach and engage people of color in STEM learning. This means going beyond programs that focus on individuals to focus on the institutional changes needed to undo significant setbacks in education caused by racism. It's a big challenge but I know it can happen. By engaging more young people in STEM education, we will not only create opportunity for them, we will also increase the quality and generation of knowledge and discovery because it's been shown that inclusive innovation, the presence of a diversity of minds in innovation settings, improves the quality and output of the innovation process. Thank you again to WBUR for discussing this important issue. These issues are of vital importance to Olin College, so we are pleased to support this work. 
Thank you so much, Gilda. And now uh, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Meghna Chakrabarty. Many of you know Meghna as an award-winning journalist and host of WBUR's On Point. What you might not know is that Meghna grew up thinking that she would be an astronaut or an engineer. She got an undergraduate and graduate degrees in science and engineering. And while she took a different professional path, I think it's fair to say that she is still fascinated by this topic and therefore the perfect person to lead this conversation. So Magna, uh, with that, I'm delighted to pass this so-called floor back to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, before we start, I, I just want to assure everyone that there's no such thing as an education wasted because I did, in fact, inadvertently achieve my dream of being an astronaut. And here's how. I found out last year that astronaut Christina Cook um, who currently holds now the world record for the longest continuous um, space flight for a woman. Every day she was on the ISS, she listened to the On Point podcast. <laughs> uh, when I found that out, we had an interview and she told me that. I was like, stick a fork in me. I am done. Done. <laughs> but, um, but, so, but, but Margaret's absolutely right. In terms of science and engineering, I retain not just a deep fascination, but an absolute passion and love for those worlds. Uh, journalism, yes, was not part of my original life plan. Although looking back, I, I suppose I should have seen it was a little bit in the cards because I would do things like go from my um, civil engineering courses would, where we'd be doing experiments in soil liquefaction. You know, you got the column and you've got different types of soil with different sand uh, concentrations in it. And we'd put like little fake houses on there and water and we'd like bang the sides just to see like which uh, sand concentration would sink <laughs> the house in the event of an earthquake. So I'd go from that then like across campus to the student newspaper and like do sports photography and um, and and edit the paper. So maybe it was actually in the cards from the beginning. But uh, my STEM education, I stand by the fact that it has made me a better journalist, I believe, because it's taught me things like thinking about how to think rigorously, about testing hypotheses, about not really falling in love or being beguiled with a preordained outcome but rather questioning your way uh, through the facts to get to the outcome that, um, that you need to better understand the world. So, and then also not just about how uh, systems operate, but how they fail. And then understanding those failures, how would you change the system to make it work? And these were like fundamental ways of thinking that I learned in my science and engineering careers. So that's why I firmly believe, will always believe, that the STEM fields and STEM education and STEM skills should be available to everyone. Though, though this world should be available to everyone and nurture everyone who, who wishes to be in it because it confers upon you for your life. Whether you stay in, stay in science, engineering, tech, math, what have you, or not, um, a way of being in the world, which to me has been incredibly empowering. So I'm really delighted to be part of this conversation uh, tonight. Uh, I'll step off my own soap soapbox now and do a couple of quick housekeeping notes before I introduce our terrific panel here. Tonight's event is streaming live uh, from the WBUR City Space Facebook and YouTube channels. And if you haven't already, encourage you to subscribe, uh, to like and subscribe so we can let you know whenever we go live with uh, future events. And we also want you to be part of this conversation tonight with us. So send us your questions throughout the program at slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. And the event code, once you go on the site, use the event code STEM, all in lowercase. And we'll get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, we'll fold them in this evening as we talk with our panelists. So as Margaret mentioned, we do have a really singular group of people uh, to walk us through the issue of diversity and access and inclusion in STEM. And it's my delight to introduce them now. First, I'm going to start with Tarika Barrett, newly appointed CEO of Girls Who Code. She'll lead this incredible organization into its second decade with the goal of closing the gender gap in tech by 2030. And before stepping into the CEO role, Tarika was COO of Girls Who Code. And before that, COO of iMentor with the mission to help low-income students succeed in high school and beyond. So 
Tarika Barrett, welcome to you. Thank you so much, Magna. And Nigel Jacob, co-founder of Mayor, now I guess, former Mayor Marty Walsh's New Urban Mechanics, uh, an innovation incubator and R&D lab within Boston City Hall. Uh, Nigel thinks outside of the box. He likes to stir up trouble for the public good. He's won many awards, including Public Official of the Year in 2011. And uh, welcome to you, Nigel. I also understand there's a part of your bio I wanted to ask you about 12th level wizard pirate. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope that people never read that. It was at the bottom of the bio, but everyone always uh, sort of tweaks me about it, but it's like I'm a D&D fan. I thought so. Okay. Well, 12th level, level is pretty up there. And also we always do our homework, so I will always read down to the bottom of the bio at least. But <laughs> welcome, Nigel. And Adrian Mims, founder and CEO of the Calculus Project, a project he started when he saw a major dropout or a huge dropout rate in math among students of color. And through the Calculus Project, he's gotten students re-engaged by showing them success stories of professionals of color in STEM, making studying STEM uh, engaging and fun. He's also received his PhD at BU and his dissertation topic was improving African-American achievement in geometry. Adrian Mims, it's great. I'm so glad to be able to talk with you. Welcome to the panel tonight. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And Carl Reed, he's just been appointed Northeastern University's first chief inclusion officer, wealth of experience in this world, also having served as executive director of the National Society of Black Engineers and director of the Office of Minority Education at MIT, his alma mater as well. So Carl, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. So your bios, that, you know, I also gave like the super Cliff Notes version of all your bios, because otherwise if I'd read all your, um, your accomplishments, that would be it for tonight, uh, time-wise. But I wonder if you could actually give us a little bit a, a little taste of your personal stories in STEM. So, you know, what pulled you into this, these worlds? Um, and let's start at that, sort of like what drew you in and, and has kept you in to STEM? And Tarika, I'd love to start with you. Thank you so much, Magna. And I have to say that as I heard you tell your story, I kind of got chills and I said to myself, I have to get you in front of our girls because these are the stories that transform lives. And I'm not kidding, every day that they can see a woman, a woman of color who can say the things that you said, sitting also in a different seat, it's just so powerful. So I just want to be able to say that. Um, I will try to make this quick because you're right, we will take up the entire segment talking about ourselves if we are not careful. But um, I'm a Jamaican American educator, tech enthusiast, equity advocate, and I'm so excited to be stepping into the role of CEO at Girls Who Code. I've dedicated my entire career to addressing inequities in education, especially for girls and young women. And this is a passion that actually was sparked in me growing up, both in Brooklyn, New York, and Kingston, Jamaica. Um, and I had a mom who instilled in me the importance of mentorship, as well as fighting for equity and making change. She also sent me to an all-girls school in Kingston, Jamaica. And so, you know, don't play any games. I have many, many stories around that. But for me, what was so powerful was that it showed me firsthand how transformative an all-girls learning space could be. It certainly changed my life. And so, you know, I brought a lot of this passion and thinking back with me when I started my career as a teacher. And then later when I had the chance to work at the New York City Department of Education, where I got to design and launch schools where issues of equity, both in terms of gender and race would be central. It was at that time that I had the good fortune of leading the team that designed and launched New York City's first ever high school focused on software engineering. Mm -hmm. It's also that time that I can tell you it was just cemented in my mind that our education system was not set up to close the gender gap in tech. And that is has grown far worse in this moment of COVID. And I know we're gonna talk about that together in this conversation, but that equity work that I did for the Academy of Software Engineering led me to this moment where I am now the CEO of Girls Who Code. And I can tell you that it's gonna be passionate, ambitious and diverse young women who solve the problems ahead of us. They're the ones who are gonna transform our workforce and our world. And so I'm just so happy to be able to support them in school and also as they enter the workforce that we actually get them to persist. And so that's a little bit about me. Yeah, wow. Um, and Nigel, I'll move to you because I'm just moving around the, the, the boxes here as I see them. 
Yeah. Um, I'm also of West Indian descent. Uh, my family is from Trinidad. Um, I originally intended to be a physicist uh, many moons ago, but like many did, uh, my classmates, uh, colleagues, we diverted into computer science. And so I became a computer science, computer scientist and uh, was a software engineer for many years in the Boston area. But at some point, the sort of the need to find a more social um, orientation to my career kicked in. And I went back to grad school to try to find that. And while I was there, I came across this opportunity to work in the mayor's office. Actually, it was uh, Mayor Menino at that that point. Um, and uh, I think that like, nobody knew what to expect when you bring a computer science PhD into City Hall. But I, what I found was there was lots of really interesting opportunities to facilitate, to, to rethink the way that government works from the perspective of you know, technology and, and, you know, collaboration with universities. And, you know, interestingly, um, you know, when I think back at what I learned in my STEM education, I think when the, 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 especially around um, computer science, what I was left with um, was really a sense that systems are built by people, mm -hmm. by humans, and they're not just dropped there, right, from on high, but they're, they're built. And so they're malleable. And if they don't work is because it's, it's, I mean, it's our job to change them, to tweak them. And that's, that was really the spirit with which, and, and also frankly, like having been in the startup world so recently, the idea of, of prototyping new ideas, you know, combined, you know, with the computer scientists in me to really think differently about the way that, that the government's role in, in facilitating all of this. Cool. Uh, Carl. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is a three, four, three, four. Um, I'm also a, a, a child of, of West Indian roots. Uh, my father is uh, Jamaican, my mother's Bayesian, and education was highly valued in the home. I remember coming home in, with the uh, 99 in third grade, and my mom would pat my shoulder and said, nice job, but what happened? <laughs> you know, I still remember what I missed too. It was a comma. <laughs> my parents would say the same thing. Like, what happened to that last percent? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so my 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 father went to Hampton Institute for two years, dropped out and joined the Navy. So he never really got to have the opportunities. But he saw in me this curiosity. I used to break my toys apart at three and four years old. And so he had me say, literally. Um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology when I was three years old. And um, and and then he saw that I was interested in engineering uh, in car and trains. And so he introduced me to this notion of engineer. So, you know, 16 years later or so, you know, I earned two degrees from MIT in engineering. So I actually, I spent most of my life thereafter largely uh, really trying to scale up that experience for, for uh, not hundreds, not tens, but tens of thousands of young people throughout the country. Um, and I went to work for IBM after getting a master's degree and went into systems engineering and sales. And, and then I read this book, Jonathan Kozel's Savage Inequalities, which talked about the education disparities in the United States. And it got me very, very angry. Um, I remember saying, um, you know, if, if this one of the richest countries in the world can do this, um, I've got to do something about it. I didn't even know what educational policy was, but I but ultimately did and earned my doctorate in education, went back to MIT to run outreach programs and then uh, ultimately, you know, worked my way up in the nonprofit space with United Eagle College Fund and Nesby and now um, doing really diversity work, helping to transform a university um, to creating access and opportunity. So. I'm using, like you, I'm using my STEM experience and STEM learning, the critical thinking, the analytical reasoning, the problem solving. It's such a transferable skill set to any discipline, uh, regardless of what you choose. And I choose to to really be an advocate. Yeah, w without a doubt. I think one of the strongest uh, uh, skills that it's given me is, is is resilience, right? Because you learn that like failure Failure is absolutely your friend, whether you want it to be or not. Did you know about my 38 in my first physics? <laughs> <laughs> you must have heard. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. Um, Adrian Mims, I know you've got actually a lot of stories. You would talk about yourself, talk about the genesis of the calculus project, you know, whichever way you want to go. <laughs> 
I give you the short version. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm originally from South Carolina. I think I'm the only one on the panel. The parents are not from the West Indies or Jamaica. <laughs> but I always tell people, if you haven't been to South Carolina, it's like going abroad without going abroad, right? This is a, a very interesting place. But I'm a member of the first generation of my family to go to uh, college. Uh, grew up in South Carolina, like I said. I went to the University of South Carolina with the intent of becoming an electrical engineer. And, you know, I was working my way through undergrad. I actually worked two jobs. Uh, I changed my major my junior year from electrical engineering to mathematics, which that's another long story that I won't go into. But, you know, because I changed my major that late, I had to take five, uh, several 500 level math courses together that they always tell you never take these courses together. And plus, I was working two jobs. And the person who saved me, I was actually able to get my undergrad within five years. And uh, it would not have happened without Kofi Fadimba. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started finally pronouncing his name correctly because, you know, with South Carolina, everybody was calling him Kofi. <laughs> great guy. He saved me one of the most intelligent, brightest mathematicians. He was there getting his doctorate in uh, mathematics at the time, and he was there with his family, and uh, he tutored me. So mm -hmm. here it is now, I'm you know, the founder and CEO of the Calculus Project, and I had tutors throughout my uh, life. My next door neighbor tutored me in mathematics, and here I am in college at the University of South Carolina, and I run into Kofi, who helped me out uh, tremendously. And so I moved to uh, Boston, uh, started working at Brookline High School as a Met co-tutor, making $8 an hour. Uh, I just had a degree in mathematics, so uh, I got an apprenticeship card at the time that would have allowed me to teach, but no one was going to hire me without the education courses. So I ended up going back to uh, graduate school several times and worked my way in the math department and then became an administrator. So I was there for 19 years. And then that's where, you know, I created the Calculus Project, which was an extension to my dissertation, Improving African-American Achievement in Geometry Honors, and had an opportunity that I couldn't resist, which is uh, I had an opportunity to expand the program nationally. Um, a philanthropist from New York um, was running a nonprofit called Replications. And then I left, and here I am now, I'm still doing this work that I'm, I'm happy to do. Yeah. Well, um, just so that uh, we keep people on tenterhooks, I'm going to ask you later about the track record of success for the Calculus Project, okay? Because right. that's a good, good story. Um, what I'd actually like to do, I've got tons of questions for all of you, and um, and actually none of them are in particular like for any specific person. So I'm just going to throw, throw them out there and, you know, I Look good. We're all we can all stay on the um, uh, in the little yellow box together here, and just feel free to, to to mix it up. And and we'll you know we'll we'll travel through the the rest of the forty minutes that we have here. Um, and plus, I I do want to say thank you for sharing your backgrounds because I think a lot of what we could collectively learn today comes not only through your analysis right now and and. Um, and what you've seen that works and doesn't work, but do feel free to bring the reflections from your personal experience uh, in as well. Because those, I think that really, just in your intros, I have like 10 follow-ups, so <laughs> I'll try to hold back here. But first of all, so let's, let's actually just pull way back and just ask the big question. So based on what you've seen and experienced in your career so far, what are, a couple of the things that you think might be major factors in the underrepresentation of of black uh, and and Latino people in in STEM fields, and and Tariq, I'll just start with you, but then feel free to jump in anyone else. Magna, it's such a good question, and. Uh... I would say, if I were to just anchor this, I would say where I started in terms of your story, the lack of representation and the fact that very often our girls, and especially our girls of color, don't see 
women who look like them. And we say it all the time at Girls Who Code that you cannot be what you cannot see. And we cannot minimize that. It's such a huge issue for our girls. And, you know, when we think about the kind of change we want to see in the industry, it means things like hiring folks who look like me at the most senior levels, right? That's a huge factor. Another one is sort of in terms of leveling the playing field in STEM is this huge challenge we face as women and women of color in tech, this misconception that somehow girls aren't interested mm -hmm. and especially our girls of color. So we're constantly kind of up against this challenge when we know it's not true. We did a study, for example, with Accenture recently where we saw that 50% of women leave the tech industry by the age of 35. That compares to 20% in other jobs. So we know that it's this combination, right, of the kind of culture we're seeing. Here are girls of color, we make them excited, we spark their interest, they fall in love with computer science. And then they end up encountering these systemic barriers when they've quote unquote made it. So we know it's not just this pipeline problem that everyone points to. The data coming out of tech, the tech industry around women and representation, it's abysmal. And yet it all gets kind of excused away by saying that we don't have qualified candidates. So, you know, it's a combination of the kind of culture reset that we need in tech. And then some of what I think everyone has kind of talked about, especially Adrian, when I think about your calculus project, how do we make com computer science more welcoming and accessible to our girls and especially our girls of color and frankly, all students of color. The underrepresentation we're talking about comes from years and years of lack of access to computer science coursework, being shut out of AP, CS, other patterns that we see. We are trying at Girls Who Code to make these inroads. We've taught over 300,000 girls to code you know, half of them Black, Latinx, low income. And even though our impact has been outsized, it's really humbling to know that only 24% of, you know, computer engineers are women today, when in 1995, that was 37%. So we're, you know, it's these, this multiple, like this kind of very complex set of issues. Tech industry is not great. We know what's coming out of there. It is structured to support white men. And then we know we have our work cut out for us in terms of making up ground around you know, computer science and coding not feeling like it's this strange thing that our kids can't engage with. But I'll stop because I know everyone has a thought on this question too. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that um, your question really has two dimensions that that Tarika so so well articulated. One is is diversity, uh, which is uh, really the representation. Where, where how how are our young people coming up through the pipeline, and who are we losing in the various process? And the other is inclusion, and th and that is really what is the climate of the science, technology, engineering, math workplaces. And why are so many women and people of color leaving at such uh, accelerated rates? And so to, to understand what the problems are, you really have to understand, be able to articulate the problems. And, and I think there's, there's a diversity. And I think that Tarika really did a, a fantastic job talking about um, access um, and, and just access to high quality STEM learning experiences. Um, as we know in the United States, education is rationed by race, income, and zip code. If you can give me a zip code, I could tell you the quality of the public school in the area. I can tell you the, the, the roughly uh, whether or not the teachers are, are qualified to teach and the, and, the, and the level of math in the schools. Um, it, a couple of years ago, some um, did an analysis that found that African Americans in high minority districts, only 57% had access to the full range of math and science in their high school. And so, and then the other thing is is identity. Um, it's just creating this this whole notion of being what you can see, and creating these access and opportunities uh, for young people. And and so it's it's sort of a, a vicious cycle in that the lack of role models or something that I've studied called self-efficacy. It's confidence, vicarious experiences, seeing someone with whom you can relate, have success, builds your confidence that you can be successful. That's why the younger siblings are always so much better. You know, Serena is better than Venus. Eli is better than Peyton and others. There's always this notion that I, if I can see it, I can become it, and I'm much more motivated. So we've got to increase the visibility. 
we have to increase access and we have to increase awareness. I mean, th th these are amazing points, and uh, I would certainly uh, plus one everything that's been said. There are some really interesting observational uh, uh, elements here. And when I look at in the tech industry, the rate at which women, maybe who start out in engineering, go into management is really interesting, right? So people very quickly leave the, 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 the engineering side of the house and become management. And uh, I, I think it's, it is very much a, a question of culture, right? The, the, the culture of technology of the tech bros is very unwelcoming to anybody that does not, is not a white man. And I think it's also downplayed by the industry where they choose not to see that. They choose not to see like the insidiousness of like that particular culture. And so, right, so in an engineering heavy company, it's all about the product, it's all about your tech skills, They so they say, but they ignore this, this less tangible aspect of the company, of the institution, of the organization. And so I think it's, it's sort of raising the importance of, of the culture of the institutions is, is vitally important. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add um, on to what everyone else has said. Um, I wanna take a different, uh, spin and look at it in terms of a K-16 to flaw, uh, a systemic structural flaw, and uh, both Dr. Barrett and Dr. Reed spoke about this. Um, when you, if, if you want to read something to really understand why education is a manufactured crisis and it's working the way that it's working and delivering these results, read an article by Jeff Howard. It's called, You Can't Get There From Here, the need for a new logic in education reform. And so when schools were created, they were created to sort. You were going to become, you know, a doctor. You are not going to go to college. And schools are still set up that way. So, for example, um, the Office of Civil Rights under the Department of Education, they uh, gathered data and they identified that less than half of the high schools in uh, the United States offer calculus. Now, why is that important? Well, if you're going to go to a four-year institution, college or university, you're not walking out with a software engineering degree or a computer science engineering degree without at least taking calculus one, two, calculus three, which may be vector calculus or multivariable calculus and differential equations. And you might take statistics. Another reason why that's important is because some of the most competitive colleges in this country, the admissions folks, when they look at students' transcripts for a four-year institution, and I'm stressing four-year institution for a reason, when they see calculus or AP calculus, to them that translates into a student graduating in four to six years. Now, I always look at STEM as two-tiered. You have two-year post-secondary, four-year post-secondary. You don't necessarily need calculus for two-year post-secondary, but you still need uh, strong math and, and science skills. That could be the person working for her chambers as an automotive technician. That person who's an automotive technician is a computer scientist, is an electrician. So how do we get students to these jobs? It's very difficult when school districts are sorting students by mm -hmm. tracking. Um, you know, you had in Boston Public Schools advanced work classes. Tracking students as early as fourth grade, determining who would get the most rigorous courses and have the best teachers. You have now this pervasive throughout a public education system where students are being tracked as early as seventh grade. And, you know, they're determining right then and there who will have the rigorous math courses and have the best teachers. So you have students who participate in these amazing programs. They love STEM. And it's just like what Dr. Barrett pointed out. They go to these amazing summer programs and they get excited, but then they come back to their respective schools and that fire gets extinguished because they may want to become a scientist. But you know what? If you don't have that math and science background, your dream will be deferred or probably extinguished because are, will you be prepared to take that next step in a post-secondary opportunity? And then you have the other issue, and I'll just say this and be quiet, and that is um, students who end up placing into remedial courses. Uh, you know, families spent, I think it was a study, uh, I think it was 2018, spent one and a half billion dollars on remedial courses. And what a lot of families don't realize is that those courses don't count towards your graduation credits and you usually have to pay for those out of pocket. 
So we, we have to, you know, change the pipes in this pipeline and um, think about some innovative ways of creating equity in the, in the schools. Mm. Well, um, it's probably going to be no surprise that a bunch of the several of the audience questions we're getting so far do have to do with K-12 um, education here. So let me go through a couple of them. Um, and actually, Adrian, I'll just toss this one to to you, do, do you th the question is, do you think standardized tests like SATs have a discouraging effect on students who score poorly who might otherwise pursue STEM degrees? I, I, think, it, I think it can be discouraging. Um, I'm very careful about the conversations that I have with my students around the SATs. Um, you know, I tell them, look, this is a test that doesn't measure who you are, how successful you will be. This is just a test that's going to determine, you know, what you're going to have access to, but it will no way, it's no way indicative of your level of success or what you will become. Um, we live in a culture where we test all the time. You know, we're always testing students. And there are two frames of mind, in my opinion, around that. There are some people that are very anti-test and they, you know, want kids to protest and, and, and refuse to take tests. That's not me. I, I recognize those barriers that are there and I don't have the power to get rid of the test. So what do I do? You know, the team of teachers that we work with, we prepare students to excel and do well on those tests by giving them a lot of tests, you know, and we don't do it in a way to create pressure. We do it in a way so that they are accustomed and they understand the landscape of the test and how to manage time mm -hmm. and how to beat the test, right? So we can teach them to fear it and, and kick rocks and be angry about having to take it, or we can train them how to overcome it. Right. That's just how things are. You want to become a fireman, you have to take a test. Police officers have to take a test. To deliver the mail, you have to take a test. Adrian, I, I will say this year has been a natural experiment Experiment because many colleges went test optional, SAT optional this year because of the pandemic. Hundreds of colleges did. And what did they see? 20% increases in, in um, diversity uh, in the applications among the most selective schools. Um, and I don't know, we don't know yet uh, the effect of that on STEM, particularly Magna. But but the the number of people who um, and I think it was NPR just did a recent um, analysis of that 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 many of the students who would not have applied have applied to the most selective schools because um, they went test optional. So uh, we'll 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 see the effect of that. But I I do believe that what we know is the best predictor of success for first year students or for many students is the high school grade point average. And we also know that the best predictor of your SAT scores is your father's income. Mm. Yeah, that's so powerful. I think, you know, the one thing I'll offer from a Girls Who Code perspective is that, you know, we're always kind of thinking of ourselves as di disruptors, especially in the after school space as well as the summer space. And, you know, the tests are going to be there, but we provide a space for girls and especially the girls of color to get at this self-efficacy, Carl, that you were talking about, the bravery, the resilience, the idea that they can lean on a community, a sisterhood. They come, their culminating projects are things that they identify in their community that they want to solve, be it the lack of black hair care products or lead in the water or bullying. And you know what? That ends up being quite powerful. And we know that we still have them coming up against these systemic barriers. But what we are trying to hardwire in them is that sense that they can do these things. We don't get to everything Adrian, that you just talked about in terms of the pipes, right? The many parts of the education system that I recognize right away were not set up to help. So I do think it's always going to be that dual approach, things that are in the in-school space and ways in which we catch our young people in these out-of-school opportunities, because those are really real for them as well. And that's often where they anchor their confidence. Well, and I'll just to follow up on that, I, I think the the, the two parts are self are mutually reinforcing, right? And I, look, I I was extremely fortunate growing up. Like um, I grew up in a family of scientists, so the outside of school opportunities were just naturally there, right? Like my parents would say, go apply to so and so's lab in high school for a summer internship or whatever. So, but for the you know the many many young people who might who might not 
who, who might be missing one half of, of sort of the, the dual uh, factors we're talking about. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is that you need you need both, right? You need the encouragement and the education inside of school, plus the reinforcement um, and expansion and enrichment and even connection to, you know, how the, the real world applications outside of school as well. Um, but I did want to ask one thing, because uh, the question about testing got me thinking, this is a hobby horse of mine, so forgive me, but I'm going to push down a conversation a little bit into the like the K through five at the moment, because I, it seems to me that, um, especially in the past 20 years, and I will put, I'll hang this on no child left behind. Um, I think we do have a lot of evidence that shows that the amount of science education, uh, or call, let's call it content-based education in K through five grades has actually gone down. So are we are in favor of the things that get tested, like math, which is important, but also literacy? Um, so it does make me wonder if, you know, if part of this is is um, providing opportunities and sparking passions, no matter what the age, but especially when they're little, um, are we missing an opportunity there? And especially if 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 certain kids don't have again those reinforcing examples outside of outside of school. Does anyone want to take a, a shot at that? I. If I may, I, I do think so. Um, so one of the things that we've done, the, the National Society of Black Engineers, and since 2007, we've run a summer engineering program for third to fifth grade kids um, in, in around the country. So we've reached about 25,000 uh, children. Nothing compared to Girls Who Code, but but at least it's, it's, and we go into low income communities for these programs. And these young people learn um, how to apply what they've learned in creative ways. So, so in other words, while they're learning how to build catapults or they're learning how to build gliders, they're learning the underlying math and science that's associated with it. I call it theory through the lens of practice, right? Um, that that they're, they can locate that theory in creative ways. What traditionally is, the way things are traditionally taught is that we tend to introduce theory first, mm then application. And what we've done is we've flocked that. David Kolb has done that uh, as well with, with learning the learning model. And the Algebra Project has, has done that. And, and I'm, I'm sure that Adrian has, where he starts with application first, demonstration, application, show you what it could do, and then learn the underlying math and science. As we move into a testing regimen, or what Lonnie Grenier calls testocracy, right? We, we, we move away from those creative ways to teach the fundamentals of, of our science and, and learning. And unfortunately, uh, it takes, it sucks out the life out of, of, of the, the interest in science. And, and I, you know, we did, ran a program at MIT called the Science of Baseball for, for eighth grade boys. And, and we basically taught the math and science associated with baseball, the physics, the, the chemi the, the physics, the, the, um, the um, 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 mathematics, statistics, probability that is associated with baseball, and then they got to scrimmage in the afternoon. <laughs> um, and we, we, we built it on, on the money ball and, and the whole cyber, saber metrics, et cetera. And these young people learned math and science, but they learned it in a context that they were most interested in. I think we need to do more of that and not less of that. Yeah. One of, one of the things... I'm sorry, I just, I just want to add something very quickly to that. And what one of the challenges that a lot of teachers face in education is the fact, it is the testing, because they have to go on a certain pace, right? So teachers too often have to create lesson plans two weeks in advance. The people come in, they supervise, evaluate them. They have the state tests that they have to prepare the students for. So that really dictates the pace of the content that the teachers cover in the classroom. So when that happens, the innovation, the creativity that uh, Dr. Reed was just talking about, that just, you know, is put on the shelf. Um, and we really miss opportunities because educators are really trying to keep up with that, that pacing schedule. Um, if you really want to see something amazing, I, I really have to give a shout out to Dr. Calvin Mackey. Uh, I don't know if any of you know who he is, but he does a program called STEM NOLA. 
And um, for anyone who thinks that young black and brown children can't get excited about STEM, uh, he's building this huge facility now down in New Orleans. But he had so many uh, young children showing up for STEM, he had to get police details. Uh. Um, and they were doing STEM out in the parking lots and they were covering friction and all of these different things. It's exactly what Dr. Reed said. You know, they're having fun, they're discovering, they're curious, they're breaking things, but then they get to the underlying issue, like, okay, well, why did this float? <laughs> you, mm -hmm. know, you know, and, and yeah. understanding gravity, so. No. You know, we're, we're getting, if I can, we're getting a, um, no. a couple of questions uh, about actually something that all of you have mentioned about the importance of, of being able to see yourself uh, in in mentors and in um, other people in the in in the STEM fields, for example, uh, uh, we've got. I'll, I'll roll a couple of these questions into one. Someone asks, "I agree that if you can see it, you can be it." So, what should this person say to their black and brown students who get to high school and say, "That's not me"? And then another person is asking, "What helped you picture yourself in STEM? Do you remember the moment you knew STEM was for you?" Many of this person's students have plans to be athletes or YouTubers. Uh, Nigel, actually, I'm going to throw that throw those to you. Do you have a, a particular moment that you knew that STEM was going to be for you? I am not sure that I have a particular moment. You know, I was a big science fiction guy when I was young, um, and I think that you know the, the idea that of the, the future is, is something that we create and it just doesn't happen to us. I think it's always been in the back of my mind. And certainly that was very much my mind as we, as I sort of pivoted into computer science. One of the things I was going to mention, I think is, is relevant here is the idea that the social context for education, right? So a lot of teachers are dealing with young people in struggling neighborhoods, right? Maybe there has been a crime disinvestment in, in their neighborhoods. And there's the question of empowerment, right? Can you young people, what do you do about these challenges that you see in your community? And so I think um, education and STEM education, certainly it provides an opportunity to think about how do you, how do you sink your teeth into some of these social challenges as a way of engaging, you know, creativity and passion, right? If you can understand, there's a way of thinking about these social challenges that you see, whether it's, you know, the 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 local climate, the microclimate in your neighborhoods, or the condition of the the infrastructure. I think that, but digging deeper into that, and I I think is is kids are are. are mad about these kind of opportunities to understand how they can um, directly change some of these things. And I think it's an underplayed, underexplored opportunity that how do we um, encourage uh, and support schools in uh, in working on these sort of issues of local, the things that impact the kids' lives directly. And gotta I, liberate them. Yeah, gotta exactly. liberate the schools, I have to say. Um, oh my, I'm just going to stop editorializing here about education. Um, we, but I mean, obviously, education is a big part of this, and we could talk a lot about it. But there's some, there's, I, I want to just um, shift gears here slightly because, um, Tarika, if I can turn this to you, there's, there's education and expanding that pipeline, and then you also talked about how, okay, well, once we have um, women and people of color entering these fields. Uh, and and working these fields, there's you talked about the cultural piece and how that's that that makes it a challenge to retain to to stay excel advance in, in the fields. So um, I think that's a really important part of this that I'd love to hear more about. How, what specific are you talking about? I love to put specifics on things, um, and then you know like how do we begin to shift that? Sorry, with the tech, I'm always trying to unmute myself, so it takes <laughs> a second. Gosh, there are so many layers, but I will try. I would say that, you know, I talked about what it means when our girls are excited and they get that first job. We know that, you know, representation is there. We've all talked about role models and those pieces, but what are these systemic barriers? What do they actually look like when our girls and young women get there? You know, are they actually supported? Will their voices be heard? Are there employee resource groups? Are there pathways for success and progression? You know, 
Is the orientation of the HR team focusing on this? There are so many challenges that we're facing. And then, of course, COVID right now has amplified them. You know, women who have to parent, whether or not their support's there, you know, are the networking opportunities at a given company, you know, inclusive? And are there hard targets in terms of really increasing diversity? There are so many women-specific supports that need to be in place, but then supports for just people of color in general. You know, Nigel talked about that bro culture that we absolutely need to dismantle. When you said, Magna, okay, liberate the schools, it's also about doing away with a set of antiquated and outdated systems that continue to marginalize. And, you know, will companies actually, right now, if you notice, the tenor is that everyone is re-evaluating their diversity and inclusion policy and practices, but will they translate into actual change? So that's like a huge question, I would say, in terms of where we find ourselves right now, because it needs system, like systems change, culture change must happen at that level. Carl, did you want to jump in? Oh, did I ever? Uh, but I, but I, but I, but I tell you, uh, Karika really did capture all of this. I, I, I would just like to. Um, a quote I often use from, uh, I believe it, it's from Ohio State's uh, Kerwan Institute. It says, inclusion requires a simultaneous experience of feeling valued for your uniqueness and having a sense of belonging on your team. That's the North Star, right? Creating a workplace or campus that, that where people feel valued for their uniqueness and they have a sense of belonging. That's not the case for, for women in tech. I'm actually on a National Academies Committee that looking at addressing women of color in tech. Um, and that's certainly not the case for people of color throughout the educational pipeline. So how do you, how do you create this, this place? You create it by having diversity. So you have to have the numbers, so have the meaningful interactions that occur in order to mitigate the, the, the implicit and explicit biases that we have. The reason that, that that white males don't see any need to change in tech and others because they've been swimming in the water for a long time. And in fact, they set the temperature of the water. And so, you know, the classic story of the, the goldfish that swims up to another goldfish and said, you know, how's the water? And, and they turn around and said, what the heck is water? The water is their water. They've set the culture in, in that water. So what, what we need is more goldfish swimming up and saying, no, the water is not right. And we need to have that meaningful interaction in order to mitigate the, the bias that, that exists. So I, I would say inclusion is the goal, but, but working on the kinds of things that Tarika just kind of spelled out, the HR policies, the recruiting policies, the promotion policies, the professional development policies, and really looking to dismantle some of those and recreate them so that they're much more equitable. And that would lead to more diversity and more success and more ultimately for inclusion. Adrian, did you want to add to that? I mean, the, the, the one thing that I would add, and, and one of the things that we're working on with the Calculus Project is establishing uh, corporate partnerships. Um, and th that's so important for several reasons. You know, students who are in college, you know, they're getting kind of the technical education in terms of, you know, they're going to school, they, they're taking the tests, the exams, or whatever, but then, when they leave college and they go into the workforce, for example, if you're a financial person working at Bank of America, it's a different culture there than working at Fidelity. It's different at Charles Schwab. So you have to really have to understand how to, you know, go into what Carl was saying, swimming in the water, understanding the culture, which is part of that water. So when students are able to get internships, mm -hmm. that allows them to get an early introduction to what that water is, right? And understand the culture. And it's mutually beneficial because those corporations, those executives, they also get a chance to get to know those students. And then once they graduate, it's a seamless transition for them to go from the college classroom into corporate workspaces. Um, one of the students in the Calculus Project, he was fortunate, he went to WPI a uh, mechanical engineering degree, he started interning with Pratt & Whitney his sophomore year, and he interned with them every single year. When he graduated from WPI, 
he had a job waiting for him and he it was like a bidding war there was another company that uh supported the calculus project who offered him a job Pratt and Whitney offered him ten thousand dollars more because they already knew who they were getting so mm -hmm. These partnerships, we have to really increase those and get students into these workspaces a lot sooner. Yeah. I think there is something also, though, when we do consider mentorships, it has to be done thoughtfully, right? So I've seen lots of moments where, you know, black or brown kids, young people get dropped into these mentorship opportunities, and there's a complete, you know, mismatch in terms of cultural competency on the part of the mentorship. Of the, of the mentor, right? Not understanding how to talk to a young black man from a very different place. And so I think we also have to encourage and push corporations, large bureaucracies, organizations, uh, 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 and so on to, to, to train people to understand, to, you know, to build empathy so that, that there, there's a, a, an actual conversation happening between the mentor and the mentee. And it's not just you know, because the, the, the worst case scenario is that, you know, you have a you know, we're big company A, we have a bunch of black and brown young people coming in and we and we feel good about it ourselves because we, we had places with them, but they're basically a waste of time mm -hmm. because they have no common sh or shared understanding about how to navigate the, the space. Yeah, well, I have three and a half minutes left with you, with all of you, unfortunately. And I want to squeeze in two quick things. Um, one is I promised everyone Adrian was going to tell us about the success of the Calculus Project um, uh, and how the model has shown it, it It worked pretty quickly. So do you want to give us give us the, the, the little story about how the Calculus Project has done or, or what it achieved even in just a couple of years, the first few years of the existence of the project? Well, I, I'll say the, the pilot project, we started at Brookline High School uh, back in 2009. Um, happy to say that the program is still ongoing, <clears throat> still serving um, a couple hundred families and students there. Uh, but, you know, when we first uh, implemented the, the CACLIS project, within a year, we saw significant gains. Uh, just to give you one stat, uh, freshman year, we would see we would lose 60 to 70 percent of our students who identified as black or African-American. They dropped down from geometry honors to geometry standard. And so what we did, we do, we did something that I really encourage educators to do. Go to the students and ask them what they need to be successful, number one. But we also looked at what was getting in the way. So what we did, we taught them the theorems and the postulates during the summer. We accelerated their learning, taught them how to work in groups. And then we clustered them into the same math section so that they could support each other and they wouldn't feel isolated and feel like the only black person in these honor and advanced level courses. And literally in one year, we saw 60 to 70% students who dropped down to 0%. Not one student withdrew and the black students uh, performed just as well as their white and Asian counterparts in geometry honors. And that's how the ball got started. And we said we're really on to something and we continue to do it year after year after year. And so now we're in um, school districts, uh, Orange County, which is Orlando, it's the ninth largest school district in the country. It's in all of the middle and high schools there and uh, several districts here in Massachusetts. Yeah, taking it national. I just, I love that, the, the speed with which um, the impact was was made and felt it's just incredible. So okay, so my last question for all of you, and I'm going to ask. It's like a, it definitely is like a lightning round, okay? <laughs> but I like to try and give folks tools too. So um, you know, it, it, do you have advice on one thing that people should take away from from this conversation that they could apply? You know, in their respective fields, as they, you know, as they as they as, as they think about these issues and try to try to have impact locally where they are. Do you have a piece of advice or, or a tool that you'd, you'd give to them? And Carl, I'll start with you. I, I would just say uh, intentionality, um, that these things don't happen by default. Uh, they have to be intentional. And uh, I've written a, a book uh, called Working Smarter, Not Just Harder, uh, Sensible Strategies for Succeeding in College. Um, but there's been some other, other resources out there just be intentional uh, about these. Uh, reach out to us, and we can we can provide you with uh, other resources and support. 
That's right. It's the seven o'clock alarm. <laughs> Sorry about that. that was Doctor Who. Nigel, what's your uh, your? Part? I would. Uh, I think one one tech we might be for, you know, corporations um, or, or companies of of any size, large or small, that are anywhere near schools to connect with that school, right? To to talk to the lead, the school leaders, build a relationship. Right. And don't assume that you as the corporate partner know the best way to engage, like be be open and engage them and say, how can we help? And, it, it, and it's not just about writing checks, it's, right, because I think the biggest resource that these companies have are the, the people, the, the, the talent that they have. Teresa? Yeah, I can build on what Nigel just said. You know, we have 12 million students who don't have access to the internet. More than a third of our Black and Latinx students don't have access to a computer or the internet. Industries can help. Organizations can help the way that we did with our girls. We surveyed them and gave them hotspots and computers. Help with the digital divide that feels really concrete. We can move the needle there. And part two of that is ask a girl if she knows how to code. Ask her if she wants to do something in STEM. Any girl could be your daughter, your cousin, your niece. Connect with a girl because sometimes it's about just looking in her eyes and introducing something that no one has asked her before. So that's one takeaway I have. Adrian, you get the last word today. I'm just going to say ditto to what everyone else has said because they, they said it all. And uh, to uh, Nigel and Tarika, um, we got to connect because I'm all about working together. And I think uh, that's one thing that I would say to everyone who's listening, uh, look to connect and network because as my grandmother used to say, many hands make light work. Yeah. Well, Adrian Mims and Carl Reed and Tarika Barrett and Nigel Jacob, it's been really an inspiration to talk with all of you uh, together. And hopefully we will, we will immediately put these good tools to work um, as, a, as a first step in try to chip chip away at this and and i think I'll, I'll last thought the reason why i love the story of the calculus project is it shows that progress can be made very quickly this is not an insurmountable challenge for us as a society so thank you for being inspirations um to keep us motivated and it's been really wonderful that you were able to all join us tonight thank you so much thanks thank you. Thanks. Thanks. great thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. everyone yeah. And for everyone who uh, participated and watched this evening, thank you as well. Um, I've, I'm finally getting used to these virtual <laughs> events a year into our collective journey together in this pandemic. Uh, do As Margaret said earlier, I look forward to us all being able to share the same space together. But uh, until then, I want to remind everyone that WBUR City Space, we're always looking for feedback for um, these events, whether they're in person or virtual like this. So we're going to be dropping a link to a very quick survey in the chat, and we would really appreciate it if you'd share your thoughts with us. So thank you for being with us tonight um, and have a wonderful evening.